Wait, so this is this comes really full circle in that what you're basically saying is that the cancellation of Milady was partially conducted by neo Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> unironically. Yeah. All right, what's up, everybody? This is Other Life. I am Justin Murphy. I just wanted to let you know that I write a free newsletter to thousands of people every week. It's where I publish my best work. I share events that you can come to and much more. We have an insane private community around the newsletter and it's free. Go check it out. Just go to otherlife.co. That's otherlife.co. When you subscribe, I'm going to send you a folder of PDFs that contain all of my personal highlights from a bunch of my favorite books that I've read over the years. So you'll get a million insights after just a few minutes of browsing these PDFs, really. They're really special to me, and I just figured I'd share them with you all. So that's otherlife.co, otherlife.co. All right, Verse. So I think I've known yes. you for many years now, yeah. like exclusively through the internet. And it's our first time meeting in person. You just moved to Austin. I think I did your podcast a few years ago, yeah. your, your podcast version four. And I think you did my podcast a long time ago also. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've just been, we've always talked about different things through DMs or whatever. Uh, it's our first time meeting. So first of all, you know, thanks for coming through the new studio. My pleasure. Uh, it's been fascinating getting to know you even just over the past hour or so, <laughs> because I did not know that you were for a while a high school math teacher. I was a high school math teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> at that time, were you also like in the deep internet underground? hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, I would, I would, you know, on your off periods, I'd be like perusing forums in like you know, and it's like trying to sneak off in the corners and like scrub the internet from my of my name, so that's how the verse uh, persona came about. Okay, fascinating. And in the few years since you left your job as a high school math teacher, you've become a, an NFT trader. Uh, you've made a lot of money <laughs> doing that, and now you've recently started working for my friend Charlie, who people might yes. remember from a few episodes ago. He was just in the studio a few weeks ago. Charlie of Nifty Island. You now you have an interesting job with him. Uh, you know, wheeling and dealing NFTs and, yes, and building so I mean, building yeah. relationships <laughs> for Nifty Island, right? Yes. So that's a that's a fascinating and, and very funny story from high school math teacher to weird edge lord NFT trader. <laughs> yes, I'm an uh, NFT show. That's my my token. Uh, no, sorry, I think my official title is in house NFT degenerate. So <laughs> nice. Well, that's very on brand. For, <laughs> yeah. It feels very on brand for this podcast for your podcast as well. And so we're going to talk about all of those things. And the other thing that I'm going to try to um, you know talk to you about today is. Um, this controversy around Mia mm -hmm. and and the Milady NFT set because you actually uh, have a very interesting role in all of this as the first person to have recorded a podcast with um, Charlotte Fang, who used to go by Charlie. Uh, Charlotte was on your podcast many years ago when the Mia, the infamous Mia account, was still running when it was active. Yes. And at that time, Mia went on. Uh, Char Charlotte and Mia went on your podcast and explained it. And it's very different than what people think it is. Mm -hmm. And it's still, you know, the narrative around this is still very confused. Mm -hmm. So you have a very interesting and special kind of vantage point on, on, on the nature of Mia on the nature of Milady. So I want to unpack that as well, since it's very, you know, of great interest right now. And, and the, I think the dominant merit narrative is, is very wrong. Mm -hmm. So so we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, you know, whatever, whatever else comes up. So, uh, Definitely. so with that as a bit of a game plan and a bit of a teaser for people listening, so they know what to expect. Um, yeah, maybe let's start with, uh, I want to go back to when you were a high school math teacher, because uh -huh. you know what, like, tell us about your, your, your internet education. Like what, uh, what were the early, you know, uh, phenomena on the internet that, you know, really cemented your like uh commitment uh to the to the internet underground so i started being online when i was i think i was like 10 um i used to be on v Bull v bulletin message boards okay uh so i used to do like hang out on v bulletin message boards and like there's actually in the terms of service you had to be 13 i remember <laughs> almost getting banned <laughs> for being like 11 they're like why are you even on here uh and i used to wait go, and what was v bulletin it's like a message board forum thing it was like a the precursor this is like yeah it was like early message boards uh, it's just like it's like a it ha they try to mimic the energy of like the old B uh, bulletin like old school internet but like in like a web two like a not even web two yet era okay gotcha. like a web era so uh, and it was like very crazy and wild like four chan kind of thing or no, no no that wasn't even there yet it was just like this is like when Leet speak was just still almost a thing <laughs> okay so like so yeah I was just doing that talking about like anime and you know like I used to do like Photoshop graphics and stuff and then like you know increasingly. You know, I get in IRC chat rooms, then you end up on 4chan, and then you, and then you just spiral down the the hole there, right? Yeah. And so, were you when you were teaching? Were you writing like pretty edgy stuff on the internet, and you had to kind of like, were you were you kind of always worried like, 
oh, if my students find out about this, I'm going to get fired. Or like, Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> like, what kinds of stuff were you writing about or in- interested in? So this is what... So, yeah, I was already... I was doing a lot of crypto degenerate stuff. So at the time, I was doing more trading stuff, but I was... You know, I was shit posting between tra- trading. I always found that shit posting, you get more connections that way than you do from, like, actually speaking on a topic with with any credibility, right? <laughs> like, if people want to see the shit post and they want the credibility like drizzled on top. They don't want to have like it to be like you know pseudo professional. That's not all right. So good strange. alpha here on Twitter yeah. tactics. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I just remember like I got like no engagement, and then like I started like shit posting, and then people were like, "Oh, this guy, I like this guy." <laughs> they started asking me to go on podcasts and stuff. Uh, so I was doing that, and then so I used to actually leave like breadcrumbs of things that the kids would think is something I'd be embarrassed about. Like I had this picture of me in a bathtub, like you know, no, no nudity, but I had it on my like Instagram because I was like, they're gonna find it. So let me just make them think that this is what I'm trying to hide. Huh, so I would like leave like you know, honeypot like <laughs> like uh, on my face, doc, like on my name docs on the internet, so they would find that, and they're like, we found something on him. Oh wow! But the stuff you, the breadcrumbs you would leave would be like not that bad. Yeah, not that bad. Yeah, so it's it was just like bad a, enough that a they decoy. Care. It was like yeah, a decoy. decoy. Exactly. Really? Wow, that's like pretty uh, strategic. Yeah, my, my 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 first name is really unique, and I used to get in trouble with my parents. My parents used to just Google me if, when I was a kid. So I would like be like thirteen. My parents were like, oh, he's been kind of quiet for like a few months. Let me just Google him. Wow. And then they, and I'm the only person with my name on the internet. So they just would go, why were you saying this on a message board? I'm like, oh, damn it, you're right. Yeah. Wow, your mom and dad would get uh, yeah. on your case about it. Fascinating. Yeah. Huh, huh. So I started to learn about, you know, OPSEC that way. That's funny because I never, I really was never involved in any of those worlds. Like my memories are as simple as like AOL chat rooms and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That That's about as deep as I went back in the day. Um, so, okay, interesting. And so what made you decide to quit your job as a teacher? Um, well, they're doing restructuring, but I also like never wanted to be a teacher to begin with. Um, they kind of just were like, oh, this dude has a math degree and we need content experts and he's not going to be, uh, the, the New York city's kids can't bully him too much since he's from New York city too. Uh, So yeah, he's not going to just get like run away crying. Like a lot of the Midwest teachers do. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating. And so, um, yeah, tell us how, how did you first get into crypto stuff and, uh, when was that? Uh, first got into crypto stuff in like 2016 or so. Um, well, actually, that's true. I bought I bought stuff on you know rest in peace Silk Road back in college, uh, and then so that's actually how I found crypto originally. Oh, you bought stuff. I'm sure very wholesome. Wholesome, stuff, right? extremely yeah, wholesome. Absolutely. Yeah, like Tylenol. And then <laughs> uh, and then I was looking for a way to apply like a math degree, and I wanted to be like I don't know why I thought I wanted to be a Fed. I wanted to work for like the NSA and be really? like a code breaker. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like looking into cryptography, and and I was like, oh, maybe not code, maybe not NSA, maybe Google or whatever. And then I just found Bitcoin instead. And I was like, oh, this is way better. This is way this is way cooler. Yeah, well, encryption was, you know, classified as a military grade weapon. Exactly. Right? And now it still is, but it's like uh, in this crazy decentralized way. Um, so are you like, are you super into Bitcoin? Or are you bullish Bitcoin? Or are you I'm actually up? increasingly bullish Bitcoin, but I'm not super into it. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I just like the space more broadly. So whatever novel innovation happens in any other, any chain, I'll, I'll find it. Okay. So you're not like a ETH maxi or a Bitcoin no. maxi. You're just like whatever. I'm 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 whatever pumps maxi. You're a profit. Maxi. <laughs> I'm, a, yeah. I'm a profit maxi right for on. sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Interesting. And so I I believe you've made uh, decent money off of NFTs, just buying buying NFTs, yeah. trading NFTs. Uh, tell us, like, what was the what was your first big score with NFTs? So the the first big score uh, was probably loot, but I also sold it too early. Um, but so like I have re- have through trial and error and A/B testing, I have found that my personal alpha, my personal metric for not metric, like heuristic for NFTs is if I have a strong reaction one way or the other. If I'm like this is stupid, I hate this, or if I'm like that's pretty dope, I'm gonna buy it. So like loot, for example, was a free mint uh, if I remember correctly, and it's it's like what it was like white letters on a black background. Wait, so whether if you love it or hate it, yeah. you're gonna buy it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I would have to have a strong reaction. Like, uh, yeah, like, yeah. Like this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I've seen too many of those things pump, so I'm like, I'm buying that. <laughs> or yeah, but it has to give you some kind of emotion because again, it's aesthetic, right? It's a uh, it's JPEGs on on top of like a token, whatever. So the only real speculative aspect of it right it's not really whether it's in good taste or whatever or like good aesthetic taste it's whether or not aesthetics you know it's essentially that it provo- uh, provokes some kind of emotion in the person looking at it right okay interesting so in my head that even if i'm like my tastes are such that i'm like this is stupid it's also kind of snobby and pretentious so it's very likely that me thinking it's stupid some random dude's like oh this is a cool this is really cool i want to be part of this nft thing. okay that's a fascinating thesis and so mm-hmm. loot 
Right. Uh, so loot was a cool idea. The idea was they're going to try to build a game from the ground up, right? So they just made like essentially character stats, if I remember, or you know items like the your items for like a D and D campaign. Right. And they just like minted like ten thousand of them, and then they were like, you can it's free use. You can just do whatever you want with this. Right. And just you can just this is what it is. So people started making characters and stats and. And they were like, okay, you know, from here, people should make derivatives off the contract. And they were like, maybe the game will kind of arise from the ground up. Right. And I think there actually are, there's a lot more stuff happening right now behind the scenes. Um, but it got super popular. And there was a while where all NFTs were just a loot copy spin off. Okay, and you bought derivative. that early. Yeah, I got that before that even happened. But I sold it way too early. It actually pumped <laughs> astronomically way past when I sold it. And I don't even want to say how early yeah, I sold yeah. But that was the first time I started to go, okay, there's something here. And I have kind of a sense of what might pump or what won't. So I was just kind of like buying stuff, flipping it, learned some like things. Like if, I can, if I'm going to mint it or buy it, I should have to not have enough money to buy two of them, right? Because you want one to sell, one to hold, like... You start to like kind of quickly get like a heuristic for yeah. how to play the game because it's like it's like the same kind of speculation as crypto trading, but even more aesthetic, way faster, way more like pure speculation. It's just yeah, you, no one cares about utility. It's it's a, it's a JPEG, right? And I always traded that way. I always traded on memes. Like I used to like write threads about like being like a meme trader. I'm not like a not just meme coins like Doge, right? But I did trade Doge too. It's my whole thing was like if it make some kind of stir you know if there's if it's had like the medic factor online on twitter then it's something that i probably should be involved in right because irrespective of whether or not it's a genuinely good project if it's got the entire twitter space talking then it's gonna it's gonna pump even if it hasn't done it yet it will because just everyone's gonna do the you know you know memetic you know right yeah and so how do you think about the long-term value accrual or value retention of nfts like do you think that this is just a short-term thing that you can make a lot of money off of you if you kind of are in the culture and you're paying attention and you make the right you know uh trades or do you think that nfts are really here to stay they're important primitives and some of these will really hold value for a very long time i think that nfts are going to be the killer app that gets people involved in crypto because everyone was looking for how do we get the normal person involved because your grandma doesn't care about derivatives your grandma doesn't care about options trading on on chain or whatever but do normal people really care about jpegs no they don't but that's not the point though <laughs> nft right. i think as a as a asset will expand right jpegs are just the the first wave right so it's you know if you even if you think about the launch the trajectory of of crypto space in general it started off with everyone making like their own like dogecoin you know black coin like just stupid stuff that they would just make in their garage mm -hmm. like in their on their home computer mm -hmm. and they would launch a coin in like 2015 13 14 and eventually you know you start to have like companies are building actual products like you know computing you just actual products are built but mm -hmm. the first wave is always just like people experimenting right nfts right there's a, obviously it became a cash grab but essentially the whole point you know it was just people messing around like people made a little project here or there and then then it kind of took off right so my whole thing is that at some point nfts are going to get to the point where any discrete asset that you might have in real life are going to be nftized right there, why should if you want to sell your house right you have a deed you have to put it on the market but why should you go through the broker deal with the red tape and why is it that your house can only sell to people in your region right there's so many like in new york city half the apartments aren't even owned by people in, in america like they're owned by like as like uh investment from like real estate companies in like china or what have you right so the idea is like oh you know i can put my house on the market maybe some person in istanbul wants to move to you know i don't know colorado like why not make it a global market Right. So so basically, you do believe that in the long run, NFTs will be how um, all assets are basically tracked on yes. chain and bought and sold. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. So like the deed to a house would be a kind deed, of good yeah. example. Right. And so, OK. Uh, but how does that translate into art and JPEGs? Like, do do you see all of these uh, JPEGs as some of them will retain value mm -hmm. as art? Do they retain value in the long run by becoming IP? How do you how do you, how do you see the art NFTs? Um, and the cultural NFTs um, playing out over the long term. So I think increasingly um, NFTs, so there are already ones that exist now that will probably retain value forever. Um, I think it's a pretty good chance that punks because right there are essentially the first one. They're, those will only increase in value over time. Like maybe the floor is a little lower than apes for right now, but there's basically zero chance in my, in my mind that it won't eventually become like priceless essentially. Um, because you, you, crypto punks, you mean? Yeah, crypto punks. Yeah. So you think they're gonna keep appreciating? Yeah, I mean, it's like if you were 
the entire space, the entire technology is essentially defined by them. Like, you know, they're the initial, they're the original, right? Hmm. So, and you know, there's a reason why AT&T decided to buy it and add it to their, was it AT&T? Uh, I think it's AT or Visa. Visa, yeah, yeah, bought the punk and added it to their like uh, little in-house like museum thing because right. it's like it's too essential to like internet culture, right? Right. Um, like it's like if you were the first Pepe or whatever, like it's just yeah, too yeah. iconic. Um, and then I'm sure there's some things that exist now that I I can't think of that will be valuable, but I don't know. But just to drill down a little more, like, do you think the crypto punks become increasingly valuable over the long term because? they are used in certain ways because they're inserted into the culture in new ways or is it just basically the same logic as art art, art collecting yeah i think there will be for punks i think it's like the art collecting thing um i think there will be increasingly more ways in which nfts are used and just so for example like uh for nifty i work for nifty island as we said like it's a video game right so it's a legitimate video game there's assets that are kind of built into it but like at some point there's going to be an nft and as of right now, if you want to make a NFT for an asset, you have to make – if you want to, like, have different uh, instantiations of that object, they have to be different NFTs, right? If I want to have a image, if I want to have a 3D model, if I want to have the sound when the, the guy does this, they all have to be separate. There's going to be a point relatively soon where you're going to have multi-layered like – like a holographic, I don't know, multi-faceted, multi-faceted like, NFT that has all those in one object. Interesting. Like, because why would why should the the two D version, the three D version, the animated version all be separate NFTs when they're all representing the same in the game object? Fascinating. So, and there's no reason why they want to improve this. There's actually no reason why you couldn't do it now. It's just that the first wave of NFTs for seven twenty ones or whatever just were like, oh, we're pointing to this type of file type, right? So there's they can make an NFT an EIP. I'm sure it's coming where there's like there's actually links to multiple types of file types. This is the animated version. This is this version. This is that version, all in the same minted object. Does that have implications for how you think about, you know, where value will accrue in terms of like which chains? Like, uh, do, is this bullish for ETH? Is this like, how do you think? So about for that? ETH, maybe it depends on if, you know, ETH, you know, the ZK rollups and all, all the stuff that they're using to lower gas prices, if these things actually are, happen. Um, but if they don't, then it'll be whatever chain surpasses ETH. But ETH is basically the, you know, the main, you know, the, the main chain for now. Right, right. I'm just trying to think through that. I mean, I've never quite heard someone say it like that, that there's going to be this um, increasingly multidimensional nature to NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, it's not obvious to me, like how if you're adding new attributes on like new types of of digital assets, it's it's not obvious to me like how that's all going to refocus or reorganize itself around like the original right. So it, let's say I own a CryptoPunk. If someone like develops some three D like extension of CryptoPunks mm -hmm. or whatever, um, like couldn't so, so couldn't someone just make the three D CryptoPunk and that's like a new thing? And, and yes, and, that could, that right. would happen yeah. because CryptoPunks already exist, right? In reality, they probably do a wrapper or something. There's a way to probably connected to the original punk if yeah. you really want it. It would probably be a wrapper. But I'm saying for new objects, so there'll be like whatever protocol proposal whatever eip happens so it's like let's say it's uh eth 2000 right this eip 2000 happens and now you have a multifaceted. oh i see what you're saying so yeah. there'll be new standards you expect new standards, exactly and and you think this is going to be driven especially by gaming gaming is the first yeah is the first obvious um the, the first they're the first like um market that needs it right right you don't want to have to mint a that you can't really do true on game like uh blockchain gaming if like you have to mint a thousand objects and then not every all these newer chains that are there for gaming right you have your harmonies you have your whatever you know they're cool it's just that but they only exist because of this gas problem right and and even still they don't have this multifaceted thing it's just that increasingly you're just not going to want if you want high volume for your game and like for your use you just don't need you don't want to have to mint that many you don't want to have that much the throughput on the chain it just mm -hmm. would throw everything right, off. Right, right. So if you want to have a character that's like has these multiple instantiations, you want to have it all together. I'm into this sure. one thing, and I can take it from one game to the next. Right. Okay, that's interesting. Or yeah. like one whatever. What was the What was the time that you got wrecked the hardest on NFTs? <laughs> Let me think. What was uh oh Art Blocks? Yeah. So shout out to Art Blocks. Uh, the curated. Uh, you know, Art Blocks were kind of like the standard, and it's funny because. I was talking to Jimbo, who is one, now the current, I guess, CEO of Milady, about it. He's like, the the thing about Artbox is that they were cool, and they were is that they were like uncancelable and sterile, 
right? So that's why they did so well, right? This, this right. Still, For I people still who like, don't know, Art Blocks, it was like yeah. almost like a factory of NFTs, right? It's like yeah. every day or every week, there's like some new art set basically put on OpenSea by Art Blocks. Yes. And they were very vanilla. It was yeah, like very, very vanilla, curated, uh, a generative, like these, they're almost all generative projects. Like you, some guys on j- j- JavaScript and just generate some kind of like abstract art or something they're like the ikea of nfts or yeah something essentially like that. ikea yeah um so you just spent mad money like Way buying too those, much money up, on and those. They, and they never a lot of those like never, never took recovered off. no they took off for sure but uh you never sell fast enough and then they all have doing most of them are doing pretty poorly right now so right. i'm hoping that i come they come back but okay so let's talk about milady now because you know i think you and i and a lot of other people agree that the reason Milady was so interesting to, to all of us and the reason why people like you and I and, and many of us in our kind of spheres got really into Milady and bought Miladies and but actually really liked Miladies and believed in Miladies, many of us still do, some of us don't, but um, is because of what you said earlier in the conversation where like you can just tell when something uh, hits and mm-hmm. it's polarizing, but you can tell when it's like uh, authentic and, and there's like genuine kind of grassroots, chaotic, um, you know, ungovernable energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think all of us kind of saw this with Milady and, uh, it was very interesting and exciting because it was a real breath of fresh air since mm. all the NFTs up until then were really, you know, relatively saccharine, mm. uh, kind, kind of happy go lucky, smiling animals and smiling, you know, little pixel, pixel faces. Right. Mm. So, um, but then, of course, what happened for people who aren't in the loop, you know, uh, it basically there was this attempt by some crypto Twitter people to basically cancel Milady uh, because the founder of the Milady uh, NFT said the founder of the Romilia Corporation, uh, Charlotte Fang, uh, basically came out, admitted that they were the author of the Mia account, one of the authors of of the Mia account. And again, for people who are, you know, uh, not up on all of this, that it was just a super controversial um, Twitter account, basically. There were a few other kind of adjacent accounts, but I think the Twitter account was the main one. And it was basically uh, this really over-the-top kind of chaotic schizoid um, writing. When the crypto Twitter people canceled it and like a couple weeks ago, they basically just like looked at some screenshots. Mm. They were like, this is proof that Mia and therefore Milady is literally a neo-Nazi <laughs> groomer Pro anorexia cult. Okay, yeah. so that that was the narrative that was basically published by some influential crypto Twitter people a couple of weeks ago, and so you know the t- the price is tanked. A lot of people, you know, there were a lot of people who were repping the lady as their as their profile pick, like pretty mm. famous people, pretty influential people. All those people kind of like uh, removed. They all them. Away, yeah, yeah, they all they all removed the lady from <laughs> fake from, fans. Yeah, yeah, and and if you go even right now and go listen to some influential crypto podcasts like. Um, um, you know, most people have taken this bait. M- mm-hmm. Most people, even smart people, right, have um, kind of just they saw the cancellation, they saw the the, the naughty screenshots, mm-hmm. and they you know somewhat reasonably uh, concluded like, oh, okay, this is toxic. I want out. Um, like I was just listening to the last week, like the Up Only podcast. You ever listen yeah, to that one? Yeah, yeah. And like they're they're cool guys. They're smart guys. But even they were like, um, it just came up briefly in mm-hmm. passing, and they basically all just kind of referred to the dominant narrative, which mm-hmm. is like, oh, these were literally neo Nazi groomer cult basically uh it turns out for people who are like actually on the internet underground and have been paying attention you know to all this stuff for many years like Mm vers and i um it turns out that's just not the case at all it just simply is not the dominant narrative that now most people believe about milady is is basically and essentially false yes um my understanding and i want to hear more from you um since you had a conversation with with charlotte um years ago when that project was active, when the Mia project was active, uh, my understanding is that it really was essentially an art project. It had that intention. Uh, there was multiple authors involved. It was a kind of distributed collective um, writing experiment, essentially. Mm-hmm. And the purpose really, from my understanding, was to basically expose in this ridiculous, over-the-top way a lot of the toxic things that happen on the internet every day mm. but in in hidden spaces mm. there are discord cults there, there are like discord groups that are are do grooming there are discord groups that do like pro anorexia manipulation mm. of, of of young women and stuff like that like these things do exist on the internet every day most people don't know that so mm. my understanding is the idea behind mia was 
let's do this. Let's actually use all of that language. Let's do say all of the crazy things that these like evil pockets of the internet say, but we're going to do it publicly and we're going to crank the volume up to 11. Yeah. And, and that's going to be like this kind of radical provocative um, freedom of speech, kind of artistic expression uh, distributed, you know, uh, creative uh, machinery that they were going to build. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's my understanding. What would you add to that? What would you subtract to that? Is that basically right? And maybe just talk a little bit about what you learned when you talked with uh, Charlotte, the the author, the one of the mm-hmm. lead authors of the Mia account back in the day when Mia was running. Yeah, that's just, it's basically exactly it, right? It was literally a means to. So fundamentally, if you like Mia Charlotte, like his whole thing is like art used to be provocative, right? Art used to that was the whole point, right? You want to like elicit a reaction, and art has gotten ex- increasingly sterile because of the cultural landscape we're in, right? Um, so the whole thing was like, and the way that Charlotte kind of operates. He, he's also extremely online. So again, he knows about these dark pockets. He knows about things that the average person just has no clue about if we, online. Well, the average person doesn't really leave Facebook or whatever social media they're on, right? So he was like, okay, cool. I want to be someone kind of provocative. Um, he's And he's the kind of person, because of how intelligent he is, that he cannot hide, so to speak. So like he, anywhere he goes, he just becomes the center of attention. Like he was, when he was on Discord, he used to become like he was saying on my podcast how he used to just hang on in Discords. Then he just kind of like had like a cold like energy, and people just flocked to him. Or like when he would get banned, like when he got banned from Mia, I found the the new account. Like like every time he gets banned, <laughs> I find his new account so fast because no one writes like him. It doesn't matter what he tries to, he can't hide. It's just his his like uh, he's just too salient. He's just, so do you know him fairly well as a person? I'm um, not super close, but I've met him in person. Does he go by him? Does he like him or? You, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a dude. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He goes by Charlie. Like I met him as Charlie. He might. I'm so not the sure Charlotte thing. Name. That's not a trans. That's just like a. a no, he, he always thing. picks a girl name. Uh, but he's not trans. I don't. He or I don't she's not trans. No. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, he's I, a dude. I just assume it was because it used to be Charlie. Now it's Charlotte. I just assume that she's a trans woman. Yeah, I never met him in person. No, no her. well, the whole mm-hmm. Mia thing was that it was like the implication was just trans, and he even like went on my podcast and made the voice like feminine. Okay. Like when he did like the the he like not only up pitched his tone, we also like had the voice you know uh, dissonance, but he like up pitched it to a sounded like a woman. Um, he always does that. I'm not sure he could be trans, but he not to my knowledge. No, uh, when I met him, he was not. Okay, uh, so you call him him. Okay, yeah, yeah, so him, we'll, yeah. we'll stick with that. So so yeah, what's he like in person? Uh, kind of nondescript, like so nor- like nor- like literally, you would never <laughs> know it was a. But you said he becomes the center of attention. Oh no, not in, per- in person. He's very laid back. Dude, and, that's like, so funny. How literally, that works, would yeah. never. You would not be able to pull him, pull him out of a crowd. But on the internet, on he's the, internet, the center yeah. of attention wherever he goes. Everywhere, yeah. But in person, he's just super nondescript. Nondescript. Uh, exactly. That's hilarious. That's often the case, isn't it? Yeah. You get it all out. You can be normally. Normal. Okay, so you you've like hung out with him multiple times, or yeah, my lady's raves. I met him a few times. And, okay. And like I know people who know him in person. Okay, great. Yeah. So as the person who basically has the initial first canonical interview with Mia mm-hmm. slash Charlotte um, years ago, and as someone who has spent time with. Uh, Charlotte Fang, you know, can you say unequivocally, like, is this a good person? You know, is, is this is this a, a dubious person in any way? Like, how how what can you say about this person's kind of ethical like stature or character? Um, I would say it's un- so from I can only speak to what I know, right? I can't say sure he might be doing stuff in the shadows, but I don't think he is. Like he is. Uh, everyone who knows him doesn't have a single bad word to say about him. He's very. He's also like. N- I mean this in like as not not a cancelable way as possible. Like he's very kind of autistic, low key. Sure. Like he's not like so like first of all, the whole like sex grooming pedo thing is so not possible because he's not particularly like sexual person. He doesn't like flirt with people. Like yeah, you talk to yeah. him, like you know what I mean? Like you don't if you're in group chats or whatever, he's like not gonna flirt with women. Like it's not his thing. So like he's not flirtatious, he's not like he doesn't have that energy. So that already is why I'm like there's basically zero chance that that's probably true. Um but like, you know, because, you know, anyone, right, you get someone in a podcast in a group chat long enough, they're going to start the the personal cracks. Right. And so his crack of persona is like a very like still a very even killed Jay Lace dude who like follows through like he's high has high integrity. Like literally, I don't know a person who knows him has a little one bad word to say about him. 
Yeah. Um, again, same, he, same. So it's like, yeah, and he like start, started him a lady. My friend, that's a lot of money involved. Didn't snake anyone. Doesn't. There's just too many people who are like vouch for him or he has like helped him out in their real life. So I, it just seems. Well, this is another thing you hear about him, which is that um, apparently he's very, he's been very helpful to many people. Like mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of people will say like, oh, he really helped me on X, Y, or Z. He seems to be like a pretty generous dude. Mm-hmm. And from what I've heard, um, you know, there are, we don't actually have known like victims or like, like all these allegations about grooming or whatever. Like, um, you know, some people have made screenshots of like text where someone is claiming to be a victim, but like, we don't know who that person is. We don't even know if those texts are actually from Mia or the Mm -hmm. discord or what. Um, it's just like people will screenshot literally just like a few sentences of someone saying that they're like uh, that they were hurt or that they were groomed or something. It's mm-hmm. like, we literally don't even know where that shot came from. Sometimes so, it's like, yeah, yeah, I did a thread. Right. And I actually, I linked screenshots of the people, the same accounts that are in those discords, all of them saying that's not real. We're friends. We were playing around like, like literally uh, there's like maybe four or five uh, screenshots of names and they're all still on Twitter. Right. So they all wrote threads like, no, do not use my name. Right. This is not what happened. We're friends. It's like a group chat. We're just playing yeah. around. The other important thing that people need to understand is that the Mia canceled itself yes. many times. So what they did, like a couple times, I believe, was they systematically went and produced like really evil sounding things, mm-hmm. and then they took screenshots of it themselves. Yes, and then they published it themselves to cancel themselves. This yes. was like truly chaotic, like Max schizoid accelerationist art project yes. basically and so what happened in the recent uh brouhaha is that some people just found some of the screenshots that they themselves produced mm-hmm. as, in this like ironic accelerationist way yes like um on our like literally even in the podcast he, t- he found he became he, he said he went to twitter to look for like landing and stuff anyone who's like nick land adjacent so that's how he actually even got to twitter to begin with he's very philosophy minded super accelerationism internet stuff he's just yeah. like that kind of person right so he yeah again like the whole thing was the thing about like Kaliak that everyone always associates Mia with which is where the you know the whole like grooming pedo stuff that people talked about so Kaliak was legitimately a art discord like there's it's very 4chan so they they don't they don't really ban anyone they just were like it's free you can join if you want right, right. so there's no like central whatever community it's just like 4chan energy and it's literally an art discord right um and further and beyond that to uh yeah so basically the whole thing with like mia was just like i don't know it's they used to run psyops for fun just like 4chan will run psyops and like just do in psyops being psychological operations so they would just run like they were just like they would like just release so much disinformation on the timeline that's half the reason i even did the podcast with Mia to begin with it's because people just had no idea what was true or not and that was like what they found fun they would literally just constantly just produce like insane like meme memetic like psyops on right. Twitter, and then they would like they would undo it and they would like laugh at you for falling for it they also right. just have like crazy bios if you remember to get people to think that they were like 14 or 15 which is another thing it's like none of them they're all like 20 something like <laughs> they all had like bios that they said they were like 14 year old girls or right. they were like doing like cisification trans and now they're now they become like they they were running psyops all day for fun again this is also like 2019 2020 so like once especially once the pandemic hit and everyone's stuck inside the psyops like got turned up to 11 and there's like no one knew it was real or not um but f- it's all fake like it's it was a way for like kind of troubled art school kids to like get energy out right right and a right. lot of this you see a lot of this kind of transition into like the milady posting style you still kind of see it it's the same kind of crew of people like who yep. liked one that found the other one and it's, it's just a more it's a slightly less uh, chaotic version, but it's still really chaotic. So, right. Yeah. And most people in our world, I think, when Milady first hit, most people like you and I knew mm-hmm. that it was the same people as Mia. Yes. Um, you know, and so on. To be perfectly honest, that was one of the reasons why I was bullish on Milady because mm-hmm. at at the very beginning, because I was like, these people know how the internet works, unlike almost anyone else, mm-hmm. and um. I knew that Mia was very provocative and very controversial and said really crazy things, but I n- always knew that it was an art project. Yeah. Or at least that's always how I interpreted it. That's always that's always the view that I had of it. So I, even though I knew uh, Mia was like super radioactive um, to the public eye, I nonetheless was still bullish on Milady because mm. um, I wasn't expecting that there could be this like sudden mass 
misunderstanding where I mean I guess I, I should have I yeah, guess I should have, have. we should all have seen that coming <laughs> um, but how do you okay so how do you think about this now because like so as we talk about this um, I want to remain bullish on Melita because I mm. do think it's an amazing art project I think it's like not nearly as um, like crazy uh, as Mia I don't find the allegations against Mia to be uh, compelling I do mm. think that it was an art project and I do think that um, art does uh, reserve for itself the right to engage uh, at the absolute limits of, of what is sayable. So mm -hmm. so I think Mia is defensible as an art project because mm -hmm. I do believe the evidence is there that it was an art project. Um, and I think there's no evidence I'm aware of of, of, of actual people who have come forward who have who've gotten hurt in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, people have got, come forward and said that, like, I heard some cases of people saying that um, – the the Mia Discord actually helped pull them out yes. of like actual grooming discords. Yes. And um, so actually, this is another thing that people forget. Well, they don't forget; they just didn't know. Uh, so it because of again, it's a troubled art kid kind of Discord, right? Though there was always a meme around Kalyak that they were like turning people trans is like a sissification <laughs> thing. But the actual like the a lot of the core group of that thing were like part of D trans. Like a lot of them were like they kind of wrongly whatever not not to be political but like they kind of like wrongly found that they were trans they kind of like they were transitioning back right so they would make jokes about tr uh bimification as of like a coping kind of like returning whatever mm -hmm. same thing with like the the self-harm a lot of people who did self-harm would make jokes about it or like there were a lot of anorexic kids and they would make jokes about anor so that's why you start to have all this like dark stuff right because everyone's like on like hashing out their like actual traumas in life via humor Right. And again, the whole mm. point is to make this like dark city, city internet thing. Right. And that's why they have the language for Poana. And they have it's because these kids were in these communities online and they were like, oh, someone's talking about something I'm familiar with. This is like dark corner of the internet that I came out of. So that's why a lot of that stuff is there. Um, but yeah, most of them, like it's, 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 if anyone, if anything's true, it's true in the sense that they used to be in that situation. This was a way for them to get out of it. Um, which is why, again, you go to like a Milady rave and the and it's all like art school kids. Is, it's like has the most like it's so funny. They got called neo-Nazi. I have never I've been to many crypto events. There's never been anything close to diversity in, in any of these events. But except for you go to the Milady rave where it's like half women. There's like more trans people than you've ever seen in any event. There's like black kids, like all of also. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not supposed to, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that, but the founding team is like not even white, like for a lady. It's like two minorities and like, uh, like, you know what I mean? It's like, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, and like, not uh, exactly your Aryan, yeah. like, uh, super race. I also right? think it's so funny too. Cause like, why would a neo-Nazi go on, pick their first interview to be a black dude? Yeah. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? yeah. I'm like, you guys didn't start. So, right, right. So. To, okay. Here's to me is the really, really fascinating open question on all of this, which mm -hmm. is. You could go two ways with what we're talking about mm -hmm. right now because you and I, I think are, are on the same page that um, this is massively misunderstood. Mm -hmm. The dominant narrative that has made the price crash for Milady in, in recent weeks is basically false. Mm -hmm. um, this is, in fact, an amazing art project with an amazing kind of pedigree that's very fascinating and provocative, perhaps one of the first truly provocative art projects like in crypto in a mm -hmm. way. Um and so if that is our perspective, and it's a it's a relatively rare perspective right now, it's very counter narrative, mm -hmm. then you could argue that Milady is a great buy, right? Because yes. this is like a seriously under, misunderstood, undervalued asset right now. But there is an, another, you know, take on this, which mm -hmm. is that, uh, and I'm not really sure just financially and, and speculatively where I come down on this. So I, I'd love to hear your opinion. The other take is that, you know, um, these platforms are not really censor proof yet. Mm -hmm. There is still a lot of centralization. Something like getting delisted from OpenSea is probably enough to, to tank the price in the short to medium term. Mm -hmm. So there are these kind of inefficiencies and vulnerabilities in the current crypto market that doesn't really make these things as as bulletproof and censor proof mm -hmm. as we all expect them to become one day or eventually. Um, and so especially in a world where narrative is so dominant, you can also make a case, even if you, you know, uh, like Milady, even if you don't buy the Mia FUD, you can still make a case that. Uh, this flack is just a little too strong. Yeah. Um, that this flack could be enough to crush the Milady project. Mm -hmm. And this flack could be enough to basically just send the price to zero and and keep it there forever. Uh, and and Milady might just go away and fizz, fizzle out. So I'm curious, how do you think about the long term like value prospects for for the Milady art mm -hmm. project as as a as a digital asset? So if you put aside the fact that I have them and like that's my friends who did it, I would say it's I'm still pretty bullish. And the main reason is 
the only reason if you guys i don't know if you guys know the history of the minting from lady it's literally i don't know it would they made it in like a group chat like they had an artist the artist sonora would literally just make like uh custom made swag little ladies for people right they had a group chat that like the one that everyone was like it's the grooming group chat the hot hot one they would literally just talk and they're like oh he would make the little chibi neo chibi things and people were like oh can you make it look like me can you da da and they're like why don't we just make this into a product so it literally was like a organic thing in their group chat that became an nft project but it, it did not mint for it, it did not mint out for months right like i remember it was nft new york city no no sorry it was before that it was like you know october and uh yeah my friend was like yeah hey, here here's like a code to here to mint it and like it literally stayed the price went to literally zero like they were like 0. 0.002 eth and you could buy any of them at the, like no one yeah. but people were still rocking them because they're cool and they and they still had their discord with their minecraft server they still were through the raves they were like we don't care about the price because it was never really that for us anyway so they thought it was dead they thought the project just wasn't going to come back but while it had it was worth basically nothing is when the posting style started to happen when people started to rock it as their avatars because they're just like this is cool and that's and that's why it's organic so even so like if you look at the price now i think it's maybe like 0.4 eth after all this fud like that is mile it's like a mult, so many multiples over where it was where people were interested in it that it's like if it was going to die it, it would already be dead they're and they're they're working on actual stuff right they're doing collaborations they're doing because it's a very much a fashion nft so they're working on like a like legitimate clothing line because there's like f like literally like fashion people in the in the crew that make it so it's like they're working on cool stuff yeah. still and again the raves are still happening they had a rave like a week ago they're gonna have one in <laughs> nft new york city so check that out uh, so like yeah they just keep doing the raves they keep having people still post with the ladies on them like right. a lot of the girls didn't leave their avatars just because this happened they were like this is fake i don't care i like it this is cute and, yeah. So and, you, okay. So you think it lives on and yeah. and will appreciate in value? Yeah, I think not it, financial advice. Not financial <laughs> advice, but I would be shocked. I, also, the number of holders went up, so it's not even like. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, so I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I think once people forget about being cringe, then it'll come back. Well, I'm I'm inclined to agree. Yeah. I mean, I haven't sold any, and I, actually, I bought more after yeah. I bought more after the fud. Um, I mean, I I do still think that it's basically the the first and only truly interesting art project in crypto yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I think that's, that's something that that's really something, you know, maybe the punks were the first, mm -hmm. uh, in an absolute sense, mm -hmm. but in a way, I think Milady is the, the, the first, the first, the first like true art really yes. in a way, if art is, you know, by definition has to be, you know, dangerous and provocative in some way, then I think, um, you know, Milady is kind of really the first case of that. Well, let's think about my original, my original investment thesis. It's if it makes <laughs> you feel something at all, buy right, it. Right, right. And Milady is making a lot of people feel a lot of things. Yeah. So, you know, eventually people are going to forget, right? Because, like, think about the reason why they got canceled to begin with is that, and I forget this, we always forget this every time there's a new cycle, but the number of users on crypto and NFT Twitter, like, went like 10x, right? In 2021, when everyone started to hear about doge and da 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 right so they don't remember anything they are new to the internet there's a new class of internet online people every single time there's a crypto pump so them seeing mia is like an alien world to them they're they have no idea how to comprehend it so when we forgot this because everyone from crypto twitter from 2018 or whatever goes oh yeah i remember me on your podcast it's fine like and that's why we all kind of forgot that this is actually really radioactive but right and we just kind of you know get blase about it but like yeah so that's why but like the aesthetic for Milady is so well now there's derivatives, but like is the most is extremely unique, right? So that's already compelling. There is of course the actual culture around it. There's you know it's it's provocative. It makes you feel something. It has the memetics. For also now you see goblins doing it. But this, what people don't remember about Milady is that there's never been a project before them that had a distinct posting style. Now you see the goblins talk and the goblins speak. You see. Cop, uh, people copying this idea Interesting. but what made Milady hit is that you had actual good posters use it as their profile and they would speak in like a Milady like a you know aesthetic and that's what makes the meme grow right they're thinking and they, they just had like they're the only ones who really understand the internet for, honestly yeah fascinating Th those are really um, great suggestions now do you think that tell, talk more about fashion NFTs because it was interesting I noticed you kind of classified it you said emphatically so this is a fashion NFT and they're working on other things. Like, how do you see these types of uh, art NFTs um, uh, developing over time? Before you were talking about, you know, the example of 
uh, gaming pushing mm-hmm. NFTs to have these kind of um, uh, new dimensions. When it comes to fashion NFTs, what do you see as the trajectory or the the longer term life cycle of of an NFT such as Milady? You mentioned one example would be like fashion, but t- talk more about like how how does the NFT connect to something like fashion, right? So um, obviously we all know clothing lines. Maybe they sell a line of sweatshirts or something mm-hmm. like that, but Talk a little bit about how you expect that to um, feedback onto NFT, onto to on-chain properties or assets. Um, just it, it, this is all like a wide, mm-hmm. wide new world. So I'm just curious, you know, um, if you have anything so um, there's, there. Yeah, yeah, I do definitely. There's um, so the thing about the way things are now with fa- quote unquote fashion with like NFT projects, right? You'll have a project, they'll make like a cool shirt or whatever. You pick, get it for free at a, a, like a convention, right? I'm sure I'm gonna get a million of them at consensus. Right. But that's essentially just, I don't know, not a grift, but that's the, for lack of a better term. It's like, you know, just stuff to like kind of give people. Right. Right. But the idea that they kind of have, and I think it's the correct one, um, I'm going to use a term that I got from Grit Cold. So shout out to Grit. Um, a, he says, like, everything online, you should be thinking of making like Marvel Cinematic universes for your online properties right it should always extend and have crossovers etc right so for them for milady right they're not trying to just make like clothing with milady stuff on it um they're trying to like the idea is that like the aesthetic of the actual drip in the milady you want to make something that people want to copy in their real life right so you want to make clothing that is like that's something that a milady would wear essentially that that people want to mimic that and also wear in real life which expands the the scope and the crossovers right so like milady if a lot of people don't know also that milady is is left crypto twitter and nft like people all those memes that people share with like the milady face on it there are normies that have no idea that it's even an nft sharing it on instagram i see right (laughs) it's because they never they're very conscious about memes and how and the way to make a meme transcend just like your genre i guess is to make people is I guess to make it mimetic, right? You want to make someone want to copy what they see, right? So for the fashion, for the Miladies, the idea is to make a legitimate clothing brand because they have like, you know, they literally, I mean, when I say art school, like they're legit like design, yeah, yeah. designers and stuff. So like, he's like, they have a friend who with, who's working with them right now to make actual like clothing brand that has an aesthetic that people will go, that's the Milady aesthetic. I want to rock that. And then now it's going to, you know, proliferate through. So it's not, the idea is not, some kind of like gimmicky like on-chain fashion thing mm-hmm. where you're like selling an nft that's associated with a sweatshirt or that's not the right way to think about it mm-hmm. the, the right way to think about it is the nfts are kind of this like uh base layer of of, of like value retention or value accrual but on top of it you're just making legitimately cool things like mm-hmm. a, a merch line or a fashion line that is just a normal fashion line that stands on its own two feet that mm-hmm. has its own business model sells for you know some some amount of profit as like a traditional like clothing company mm-hmm. would but in being cool and being fashionable yes it it implicitly redounds to the value of the nft set exactly not through any kind of like formal gimmicky technological linkage is exactly that, is it's that right yes yeah, it's, it's it's ground up right you don't want to what the issue that they have with that's why, that's why it feels like a grift when you have like a a t-shirt from like board apes or something right board apes has clothing and like you know they're selling a community and like an aesthetic that people want to buy into right so it's the but a little more normy sense but like if you're in a countercultural world right it's never being dictated what's cool is not right cool, right <laughs> yeah. so the so especially since they're like legitimately like a counterculture nft the idea is to like make something cool inherently so like they made miladies cool miladies were worth nothing and they made it cool before it was worth value like the the capital falls attention right so they just draw a lot of attention always as much attention as you can possibly draw and then the money follows right so similarly you know first they have the nft layer blah 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 now it's like, how do we draw attention? We make Milady rave, right? If you go to the rave, half of the kids don't even know what a Milady is. They're just there because it's the cool <laughs> thing to do in Brooklyn, yeah, yeah. right? So you're like, oh, there's a rave in Brooklyn. They have the best DJs, you know, the best cool whatever DJs going. They're like, oh, cool rave. And so now that you draw attention, you go to all the cool spots, blah blah blah, and then people start going, oh, they're dressing like this. Now it's a scene. Now you make and that and it grows that way. Okay, fascinating. I mean, that's kind of interesting because there are these different. There are these different competing ways of trying to operationalize this this link between fashion and culture and and kind of the the crypto economy, right? I don't mm-hmm. know if you've seen like Metafactory or something like this. No. Um, yeah, there, I, I, there, it's I forget the details of it, but it's some kind of um, 
you know, system that has something to do with like linking NFTs and, and something like clothing or something like that. Or the, the board ape is, is another different kind of competing hypothesis in a way, because mm-hmm. the whole idea behind the board apes, as I understand it, is is that it's supposed to be IP. Yes. So if you own a board ape, you're allowed to like make a movie out of your ape or something like that. Yeah. In a, and you have like the legal rights to that or something. Yeah. But what you're saying is kind of it seems like you're, bear, you're so bearish much. on that model. Like <laughs> I'm that's so not, bearish on that. That's not the right way to think about it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying not to be like super shy and forward about it. And like, you know, let, you know, live your life, live your truth. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I genuinely think board apes are going to go to zero. I don't think that that's going to look to us like. Uh, like uh, what's it called? What was the coin? Um, Digibyte or whatever looked in 2017, where it's like shoot shot up to the moon, or like you know, there's a there's always a fad in every cycle, and I genuinely think in like you know, make, give it another cycle of NFTs or two, and like, no one's gonna care about board apes. But that's right. me, you know. Have fun with your bag though, like because it's too <laughs> it's too much like rich people trying to be cool and then making it cool because they're there. It's not. Because it's cool, you know what I mean, and also like it's so cringe to like say I'm ape number da da da, da <laughs> or like Seth Green got you know try to make uh, his like make a, a cartoon about it and it got stolen like <laughs> it so, got stolen yeah, it got stolen cool. the only I honestly here's a hot take half the reason why board apes are even cool is that they are consistently getting uh, stolen so if, so like that kind of adds more attention and makes them like more kind of like a I don't know. I just I feel like they would not have as big of a meme space if it wasn't for the fact they get stolen every other day. Oh yeah, because that's always a new story, right? It's a new story, literally <laughs> every other day, right? Now, oh, Discord attacked. There's millions of NFTs lost. Because of the, the yeah. So or people start doing phishing things like uh, the phishing, the classic one I heard, uh, and I won't say who did it, but you know who you are if you're listening. Uh, they asked someone literally just to see if they could do it because you know they asked. They said, "Hey, listen, um, I'm gonna animate your board eight, right?" And they were like, wow, yeah, yeah, he's like, I'm an animation company, I'm going to animate it. So all you have to do is send me the board ape, and boom, and we're going to animate to send it back to you in 3D. And, and then they were like, sure. Like, classic, like, web one phishing, like, not even, like, intelligent, just like, hey, send it to me. And so, like, <laughs> it, like you know what I mean? Like, it's not even like they didn't, they're not, they're not getting hacked. That's they're, like, hilarious. asking, or they're falling for email phishing. It's, none of it's, like... So does that imply that the board ape, holder class is like disproportionately stupid or like yes. what? um the or normie i should i don't mean to be no, cruel no, no, no. i don't mean to be cruel i mean like uh, I they mean, just disproportionately don't understand how yes they're not works. internet native at all so actually this is hey to, to bring it back to mia who actually invented the binwit top whip meme everyone says like oh Mid-Wit. no really yeah mia invented that meme the bell curve the bell curve 100 percent mia is the source of that one wow yeah that, so that's, that's uh, some street cred yeah, yeah. dimwit top whip is mia so if you're if you're using that you know who, where it came from um so the whole so like there's only two things that pump the uh, 50 IQ or 150 IQ. So if you're not 150 IQ, you got to go 50 IQ. <laughs> so Board Ape is a classic 50 IQ uh, project, and I guess my ladies is your 150 IQ. But like everything in the middle, you don't want to be midwit. Those suck. Uh, but, but yeah, so like Board Apes, they're not internet native. They do not get the culture. They're you know it gets chilled on late night TV. It gets chilled on like what's yeah. it, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. Like it's not crypto native. That's, so the only things that pump are 50 IQ or 150 IQ. No, literally. That's yeah. like that's like a bitter pill to swallow for someone like me who's like fairly <laughs> smart, but I'm not I'm not 150 IQ. I'm no. just not. So what it means is I kind of have to bite the bullet and accept yeah. that you know if, if the 50 IQ is like where I where I. <laughs> hey, look, look, hey, I'm I understand the same thing. I'm not. I don't have the 150 IQ takes, but I definitely come with the. I know I can recognize the 50 IQ play now. It's especially it's, it's it's especially hard as you get close to 150 IQ. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I like I'm a I'm a fairly smart guy. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not, but I know that I'm not 150 IQ. It's painful. Right? <laughs> so so it's like it's a far, it's a hard drop to go all the way down when you're but, when you're like up there. You're close to that, but you but know. you know who probably is 150 IQ Mia. So <laughs> like if I had a guess, like I mean, I, again, he, he can't hide. Anytime he posts on Twitter, I recognize a new account immediately. Yeah, no, it is. That's one of the other reasons why I was so bullish on Milady and bought some Miladies relatively early. I, I didn't get the free mint, but um, I'm always, you know, I'm a I'm a boomer millennial. millennial. <laughs> I'm a boomer millennial, so I'm always like a little late to ship. But um, but it was in part because I of the faith I had in uh, Charlotte Fang as an operator, mm-hmm. like because knowing from about the Mia stuff and also just like I, I actually paid a lot of attention to uh, Charlotte's comments on things and read some of the AMAs and different mm-hmm. discords and stuff like that. And they have a very, very first principles kind of thesis around like how internet culture works mm-hmm. and uh, much more kind of impressive and compelling than, than most um, operators in this space. And also just the sheer work ethic and the, mm-hmm. the like internet productivity. Like there's a certain type of aspect to internet, you know, Twitter kind of like social media productivity mm-hmm. where it's like um, you're almost like leaning into like constant internet chaotic distracted distraction mm-hmm. but you're like 
leaning into it so hard that you're like hyper productive and you know yeah. how to, you know how to like play it in a way um it's kind of hard to describe but you know it when you see it mm-hmm. and i saw charlotte fang as as like um a, a top-notch internet culture operator mm-hmm. so i honestly i when they stepped down yeah you know I, I guess some people found that was a good idea oh good like we'll separate yeah, i don't think we'll I separate the didn't. toxic from the milady but when i saw that charlotte fang stepped down i was like oh this is bearish because yeah. like i was kind of betting on them as an operator yes um i think though i don't know the details of this so this is literally just me project yeah. whatever i think he stepped down as like a you know specifically from like the uh revenue right because they're getting royalties when people trade so he stepped out in that capacity and he's also not running the project anymore. Or like he's not the head, but like everyone's still friends with him. Right. They didn't, they didn't just drop him. Right. So it's not like he doesn't have ideas and you know, you hang out with your friends at their house. It, right. It's still cross pollination. And so Jimbo, the, the, yeah, heir, the heir to yeah. the throne, you, uh-huh. you know him too? Yes. That's actually like my friend before NFT. Like we've known him for like five years. Okay. And well, so what's he him. like? Uh, r- also really cool. All right. Uh, without his, he's an art, kid like his parents are artists and he's an artist and he's been in crypto space for a while actually everyone probably has seen his account he doesn't have a huge following but everyone knows him like because he hangs out with everyone yeah so like he's the kind of person who like if you're in crypto you will meet jimbo eventually like okay. he'll go to events like everyone knows like you have his number like and was he not a, a, a contributor to mia or no no okay he was in the he like he was another one of the accounts like so me and him largely it was just him and me actually are the crossover and a little bit grit cult are the crossover between like uh, esoteric Twitter from like that era and crypto proper. Like a lot of the crypto accounts know, like even got involved in like frog Twitter or any of that stuff because him and I were like cross pollinating the two. Okay, right. Cause we were both interested in like this, this schizo internet. And right. so we would bring that back and forth and you know, I would bring them on a podcast or we'd, we'd open it, add them to telegram and uh, like telegram groups or Twitter group chats. And so we actually made that merger happen. And I, so in large part, there's a reason why Jimbo's involved in Milady is because like he helped, um, Kalia kind of had a split between the NFT half and then like the, you know, weird half. Right. <laughs> and then the, the, actually here's another thing that here's a deep lore that only I would know. Um, so I get me, I gets associated with Sonny cause they used to run the, the discord together. Sonny's the, the neo-Nazi one that everyone talks about. <laughs> Uh, Sonny also came on my podcast, but, but he he did say he was a neo Nazi on my podcast. So oh, he that, is actually a neo Nazi. Uh, but he so it's weird because <laughs> he's so as my friend Lucas said, uh, he is so racist. It actually comes full circle, <laughs> and he's like super lib. Like he's like really yeah. Like so like so it's like and is he, he a minority? No, nah, we uh, like trans. Trans, okay, yeah, but like, white person, white person, yeah, okay. But like imagine being so racist that now. Uh, you've become so like like culturally liberal, because the the premise is that like being super culturally liberal is an inherently white thing to do. Like he's like it's because of whiteness that like you can have a super trans like Whoa. <laughs> yeah right and, like and he's like and it's so funny because he's not even like not seeing like the like skinhead way. He's not seeing like a he's so obsessed with like anthropology. Like like super like I'm at like just super no no di- no uh no sleep type of autism about like uh, di- migration patterns of the step people like <laughs> yeah. dude knows everything for no reason about like you know Indo European like, like just too much right so he's like a Nazi but he's like really like not really he's in school somewhere he's like some twenty two year old like I mean he was on my podcast too so like he can't be that racist. Uh, so but like, he identifies as Nazi. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty yeah. racist, I guess. Yeah, right? it's pretty. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's still being. Yeah, he's like it's racist and like he's saying it, but like I don't know. I, I always feel like people are larping online, honestly. Okay, and so what? What was his relationship to? Does what's his relationship to Milady? Not none at all. Okay, so just oh, that, I see. So so basically, what you're saying is he was per, he was one of the kind of because Mia was this like distributed yes. thing. There it was very like not gate kept. Like yes. th- these are more or less like unknown vague internet identities on discord or whatever yes. so what you're saying I, I think is that um sunny was one of the many you know dubious actors involved in the distributed mia thing yeah and and actually maybe sunny was like an actual racist or like a, yeah, yeah you know um but but that but you can separate that from yeah yeah it's not, mia, it nothing the, to do with milady at all the, the part of mia that went on to do milady is a is a separable part of that yeah a, a completely separate part but here's the other the part that was the reason i brought that up was that during this whole cancellation thing, because again, they run PsyOps for fun. Right. Half of the the like the information that would surface 
over the course of the cancellation was literally sunny in them because they they fundamentally hate nfts they believe it's like evil oh interesting they don't believe in commodifying art whatsoever and also they don't believe in selling anything on the internet they think that's like the greatest sin like everything's to be open source and free and let things yeah so like they were literally like sending fake screenshots and like adding disinformation running psyops during the cancellation to make it worse because they wanted to kill it Really? Yeah, and that's genuinely true. That's not me like being schizo. Whoa, that so, like okay. legitimately was happening. Wait, so this is this comes really full circle in that what you're basically saying is that the cancellation of Milady was partially conducted by neo Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> unironically. Yeah. So like, oh, they're like, oh, so there's that screenshot of like the like the swastika thing. Like they 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 were sending stuff that they had to you know to as a part of the cancellation associating with Mia. Wow. That's yeah. fascinating. There was wow. so there was a, so it's also extremely hard when you're writing a thread to be like, hey, so all right, so not only is this <laughs> fake, there's also like the schizo <laughs> Discord that's having an infight and they run psyops and one half of the like I can't explain that in a thread. So in a thread, I had to be very concise and be like, this is not true. But in reality, there was like a, a turf war. It was like a a civil war happening during the cancellation. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. And so, ironically, the the NFT kind of vector that comes mm. out of Mia was precisely not the 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 dubious sketchy mm-hmm. po- possibly racist like yeah. uh you know larping neo nazi kind of kind of thing cuz even the, even this like nazi is like yeah. you know it's not like they're like going to like uh hitler meetings exactly, or something right yeah. it's like um, it's kind of like ironic uh, or like provocative or a, a provocative like self identification yeah. or whatever. I mean, is that person Sunny like a functional like member of society? Like I think it's like an uh, academic. I don't know. So maybe really yeah, a professor. Oh, uh, not a professor, but like in school, like in like college of some sort. But uh, surely like the Nazi identification is not like a public. No, thing. I mean like... they're. I think it's like a mix of no, definitely not public. Yeah. No, no, no. It's like uh, you know, like they're like I'm a national socialist, right? Whiteness is blah blah blah. And I like socialism across like the, you know, so it's like they're being like a n- national socialist. Uh, and also it's provocative, say Nazi. You know, now, like, was that w- w- was that like a uh, a contingent uh, or group of a subgroup of people in the Mia culture or just no. one outlying like weird person? It's literally just sunny. Just one weird person who yeah. identifies as Nazi. Yeah. Uh, to what degree that is actual. Versus I think he called himself a hyper racist. Like, like, okay, right, like right. you know, Mia had the whole like hyper racism thread. Like uh, if you guys remember Hakan, that account. That like meme account. It wasn't a meme. He would like write. This is so deep lore. But there was yeah, a Hakan. Yeah. There was like a Twitter account that got banned, and it was people were speculating that it was actually a black dude. But he would write these extremely like hi, literally hyper racism. Like he was like, "There's more than five the the five races that you guys know. There's hundreds of races." <laughs> and like and he would like specifically be racist against like your haplo group. Like like it gets like really really niche. It's like okay, not only are you uh, you're Scottish, but you're Scottish of the wrong haplo group. Like it just got like extremely right, right. like densely right, right. race so it became kind of a meme i think and so like there it's not even a true i don't know it's a larp i don't know i think it's all larp but uh so he's like an academic i think he's an anthropology student okay fascinating or, yeah. fascinating I feel like the first half of this podcast did a great job of convincing everyone that uh, it's all yeah. innocent. No, no, no this like, is <laughs> no. I generally say Senny had absolutely nothing to do with it. Like, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, not even involved remotely. He but, would. He's so uh, like you can even listen to my podcast where I talk to them. He he for a long time talked about he doesn't believe art anything should be sold online. Like that's like a really major theme of his. Right, account. but was involved with Mia because Mia was this like widely distributed yeah, chaotic yeah. thing. Like with, it was like, mostly Charlie that posted on Mia, but like uh people who had access to the account to add stuff to it. So yeah, yeah. Okay, fast. But but people don't necessarily know who people really are. Yeah, and, they don't like, know, you know there's no like uh filtering process or whatever. Or like to the degree there is, it's not very Yeah, you know, it was pretty like, or whatever. They were like loosely associated with friends in like in a yeah, group chat. Yeah. Okay, so um, you, you have a podcast version four, which we've talked a little bit about uh, with the canonical Mia interview. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you have a foothold in the creator economy as well. And uh, one mm-hmm. of the topics I'm very interested in on this podcast to talk a lot about is kind of what we expect to happen with Web3 and the creator economy mm-hmm. for things like podcasters and for writers and, and, and um, you know, these other types of, of creators, maybe not so much into like, you know, visual art like JPEGs or fashion, you know, but uh, for writers, for thinkers, for podcasters, um, I'm curious if you have any just intuitions about that. You know, um, we've some we've seen some experimentation around this, but it's like the patterns haven't really shaken out as far mm-hmm. as I can tell. So, you know, there's things like 
the mirror suite of, of blogging tools mm-hmm. where, you know, you can write a blog post and, and mint it as an NFT or do a crowdfund through the blog post. That's a, that's one kind of interesting mm-hmm. project right now, mirror.xyz. Um, and then, of course, you also see some some creators or writers um, who do a kind of um, token gated community. This mm-hmm. is another, you know, c- pattern that you're seeing. Um I'm curious just, you know, if you have any kind of intuitions or first principles when it comes to how you think like writers and thinkers and and uh, this class of creators should be thinking about, you know, NFTs and tokens and what you expect to stick, what's most promising to you, what um, is bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I like Mirror, but I don't think that that's going to be the prevailing um what, like winner like that that uh that, that type of creator economy i don't think it's going to work long term but i think it's cool i, I hope yeah. it does actually I, I would love if it did i've seen the multiple versions of this kind of thing where it's like you get paid for writing and it's like nft or like a coin or whatever right. and just i feel like this should never work out um i am hopeful though of like i think the way that zero hp lovecraft did his book i think that's a really promising way okay so if you guys know he usually releases works for free and he released his book for free but he also made a dedicated compilation book with like leather bound covers and it had like a really sh- limited release right. and each book was like a uh, nft like you could buy the book and he would send that the physical press printing of it right so like the information in in within the book is free can be easily distributed right um and i think that that's going to be it's going to be increasingly difficult for like actual words to be monetizable but i will say like but you can always make like a oh you're that core 0.01 percent of my fans who really would want a leather bound version of my writing so here's like a here's a 250 limited release press of right. my book and now you can buy that and that sold out like immediately so okay fascinating so yeah for people who weren't following that what you're talking about is a, an nft mm-hmm. sale where the NFT is associated with um, a very nice kind of high value physical mm-hmm. product, uh, limited number. So I think they, you know, he sold that for something like what, like 500 bucks a pop or something yeah, like something up, up, there, up yeah. there like that. Um, and so in this model, you get uh, a very nice physical product and you also have an, uh, a digital asset. Mm-hmm. I guess you could then like sell yeah. one or the other. So they're not necessarily linked in any kind of um, no i mean like eventually i think this this link will be a little easier to be transparent on but it's essentially just like trust that i'm gonna send it out to you like this is you have your certificate i'm gonna send the book to you right right but but just to, to clarify for the audience the idea is not a formal linkage between like this physical copy and this digital asset oh yeah yeah that's not formally that's no. not the idea um yeah you could theoretically sell them separate and they you know i could theoretically sell the token and the book to different people like right that's right. possible but okay so you think that model is is compelling and and people should should take that seriously yes um what else are what do you think about token gated communities um what do you think about social tokens what do you think about you know um you know into uh yeah, the, the, some of these other experiment, experiments. I don't know how I feel about token gated communities. I, um, I have a very strong idea about. Uh, that's actually Alexander Bard. I like when I'm on a podcast where I can just reference people that you actually know. Yeah. Uh, so like Alexander Bard has a whole thing about how like increasingly in the internet, like when you start selling, like there's like the internet is like attention based uh, economy, and so you know like you know his idea about like the lead online will like congregate in these like groups and whatever and get ex- increasingly exclusive but when it loses its value from an attention sense that's when you sell it to things right so mm-hmm. i feel like a token gated community is already enacting that i'm selling this so it's it's lost it's cool you know what i'm saying oh fascinating so so oh, okay. the community so- itself should be exclusive and people want to get in right but when you're selling access to the community now it's lost its possessed I see. Interesting. So it's almost like once you start selling access, you're it, it's on the downslide yeah. in a way. And like um, this is also again, again, uh, Charlie. He made it so he was very pro right click save. Right, everyone's like, oh, right click save. What if, I can right. always download. He's like, you should. In fact, just pick whichever one you want and rock that at your profile. He's like, you should. This is network spirituality is what he called it, but it's the same concept. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to gate this with money because when you do that, it loses its, you know, cultural cash. Okay, fascinating. Now, and so. So, okay, so you don't like the idea of like selling access to yeah. communities for that reason. That's interesting. Yes. Now, the other th- thing you said, there was another one, another option you said, though, I did. Um, oh, social tokens, like the fungible like yes. ERC. Uh, so, this I do think yeah. is possible. So, actually, I think increasingly. Um, this is like friends with benefits as yeah. an example. 
I think increasingly, um, basically every niche internet community is just, like, especially as this, it gets easier to do this and to mint whole blockchains. Um, I think increasingly every community is just going to make some like internal like currency. Like I don't think it matters. I think a lot of money is kind of fake anyway. But the use of the money is is real, right? And it will have value. And especially within a specific community, something might have value, right? We do this with video games already. Like, you know, there's internal currency in a video game. There's like whole economies that are based around like fake ships on Eve, right? Like where people spend thousands of dollars of real money on fake items, right? So I think increasingly every niche community is just going to start having like their dedicated coin and token or whatever. And it's just going to build these like small uh, niche networks and they're just going to have their own. Okay, fascinating. You know. So, so you are bullish on the ERC twenty one to or twenty ERC twenty tokens, mm-hmm. um, but you're but you're not into the idea of selling access. So, um, is the are are the fungible ERC twenty tokens like in your mental model for for creators and communities? Uh, just something like you kind of like airdrop to people or are people going to be selling these? Oh, um, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you can buy the coin, right? But there's always typically ways to earn it without buying it, right? There's always ways to right. like a lot of times people get um, bounties and discords. If you help out, like someone's like, oh, there's a thing we don't have time to run. But if anyone wants, we'll give you this much of our coin. So bounties are a lot of a good way to run them. I'm sure there's, there's always ways to earn the asset without buying it. I right. mean, I do think you can just buy it. That's fine. Right. But it's not quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. Yeah, so. yeah, gotcha. Okay, interesting. That, that's fascinating. I guess another pattern that you're seeing is NFTs as almost like badges or mm-hmm. ID cards or identities within communities or something like that. So, yes. um, what do you think about that? Is that going in the right direction, or is that a false? Is that a false lead? Um, um, so the idea yeah. being like, you know, there's some set number of NFTs. Uh, so to be in the community, you have to buy an NFT. So it is kind of like selling access, but once you have the NFT, then like you're in and. Uh, that it's like a membership card in a way. I think that at the moment, I think it remains to be seen, but I do personally think that there's, there's just something different about the model of like, I don't know, having the NFT is always cool, right? Like you want to be like, I'm definitely a certified member of this crew. Right. And there's a limited number of them. And that's why we all want to buy them. These are fun. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's something to be said about being able to have access without actually owning the NFT. And like the NFT is just kind of like the inner circle, right? Like it's like, I am like a certified holder of this. Right. I don't, I think like the other version of like the board apes thing where it's like, I'm this number and you can only enter our party if you have board ape and like I can verify it. Like I, I think that's going to exist. Right. Cause everyone, you know, everyone wants a country club. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think country clubs, you know, are cool, but the whole point of the country club is like, you want to be inside the country club because you, the people who are there are cool. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's why people want to get access to it. That's why you're willing to pay the money to get in. But that's a very like boomer way of thinking of it, of everything. Right. So the internet's a little bit different. Like you can't, there's group chats that you're, you can't pay to get into like the, I mean, what Kobe has shown his group chat with Vitalik and like, you're not paying to get into Vitalik's 10 person ETH group chat with Kobe. Right. It's just not going to happen. You don't have enough money and it's too it's too priceless to them that you're just not you're not cool enough sorry but the even though it is a group chat filled with billionaires it's still like it's because i don't know it's just like it, social capital is more important than the actual money yeah that's an interesting uh, i see what you're saying yeah like the, there are certain things money can't buy yeah and in the internet increasingly that's going to be what's scarce is like you just can't get in sorry Right. And if we start selling access again, like I said, I think it's that shows that like either the people who are involved already don't care anymore. Like they've moved on. So now like, sure, I'll sell. In fact, well, I'm not going to say his name because he's doing this right now. But some like there are discord groups and stuff like that. Like people are selling access to it. I think a lot of it's like it's kind of lost. It's what was there. Like there was an early version of that that was free. That was that made the buzz that makes people want to buy it to begin with. Yeah, no, that's a that's very thoughtful and makes makes a lot of sense i mean i'm thinking about this stuff very hard because i'm definitely like starting to think in a longer term way about how to orient my you know creative operation Mm -hmm. in in a way that's going to um grow successfully over the long term with all of this technology that is is coming out but i'm trying to go very slow and think about Mm -hmm. it you know from first principles and really develop like a long-term strategy as a writer and as a a, you know the podcast and everything um and it's vexing it's like very because there's so many different experiments so many different mental models about how to use this stuff and it's mm-hmm. not it's also new that we don't really know yet so mm-hmm. that's a lot of um thoughtful suggestions there so thank you for that mm-hmm. um cool well i feel like we've covered a lot of ground i don't yeah, want yeah, to keep you too long are you oh so are you doing anything for consensus um i'm going to a lot of events um i'm not specifically speaking or anything though 
Cool. Yeah, okay. I'm just I'm gonna be at the parties. I'm gonna go to shake hands, mingle. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me know about the cool the cool stuff going yeah. on. I've been kind of uh, we just had a baby, so I've been like kind of oh, yeah. stuck in the house for and like my mind has been on other things. Uh, but if there's some cool stuff going on that I should be at, uh, hit me up. Word, and I got and you. Um, what was I gonna say? Are there people in town for consensus? that uh, are especially interesting to you or that you're paying attention to or like um, anything in particular that uh, you want to. I mean, about? a lot of the, uh, a lot more of crypto Twitter and like, you know, online personas have come to town that I anticipated cause it's like Austin. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So I'm, I'm just excited to see my friends, you know, meet some more of the people I've been talking to as like just an avatar. Right on anyone in town who I would know maybe um, that you're thinking of. Um, I don't know if I want to dox it there. Here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, okay. a lot of, a lot of like the people who are like, you know the little animals on crypto Twitter. A lot of them are coming to town. I'll say that. Okay, so, we'll talk. We'll talk yeah. when, we, when we're done. All right, first, well, thanks a lot, man. This is yeah, really likewise. fun. We covered a lot of ground. I think this will, uh, you know, I think um, change how a lot of people think about hopefully the whole Mali slash Mia fiasco and uh, yeah, some some real alpha here. So thank thank you nice. for all your input. I appreciate it. Oh uh, no problem. Thank you. All right, man. That's a wrap.